all set? Good evening and welcome to the December 2nd, 2008 school board meeting. Would you please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, Alan, adjustments to the agenda? Uh, I do have a couple of adjustments. Hang on just a minute. Uh, on the second page, under uh, New Business E, uh, we have a community services appointments that we need to talk about this evening. So uh, Kathy is bringing those, and I have the uh, discussion about who they might be. That will be under F, right? So that is, was it F? Did I say e? Yes, I'm sorry. It is F. Uh, also, I would mention to you that on the first page, under recognition, we have High School Theater Club musical. Uh, Dick Mullen has asked if he could come in January instead to do that presentation. So we've changed it to then. Uh, so that's that. I do have one other recognition that I'll take care of as we get down through that. Uh, I think those are the only other things I have changes on. OK. Great. Thank you. Um, Moving on to the approval of the school board minutes from November 4th, 2008. Is there a motion? I move that we approve the minutes from the um, November school board meeting as presented. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Thank you, Peter. Um, errors, omissions, discussion? Uh, all in favor? 6-0. Did I rush you, Rebecca? No. OK. Um, comments by student representatives. Do we have the um, middle school representatives here? My name is Piper Otterbein. And for the middle school, on December 5th, the trimester ends, and report cards will be sent home December 12th. December 10th is an early release for K through 8. Also, December 10th is a community day for the middle school. Also, the middle school recently had a fundraiser called Stuff the Bus, and there were over 2,000 non-perishable items brought in. And that's all. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kisa Tiberi. On December 9th, there will be a band and chorus concert for the 5th and 6th graders. Also, December 10th, there will be a, a band and chorus concert for the 7th and 8th graders. Both the concerts will be starting at 7. The middle school fall play Night Chills just ended, and the middle school musical will be starting soon. December 19th, there will be a middle school dance. This year, there will be school on December 22nd and 23rd. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, high school. I guess we just have Sarah for the moment. Yes, Andrew's on his way. Oh, speak of the devil. Uh huh. So, right now, I'm the SAC. Or you, uh, you speak oh, yes. um, in the SAC, the Student Advisory Council, we just had a survey committee work on giving out a survey um, that reached a good percentage of each grade. And um, it asked different questions like, what, are your, uh, what do you think are the three biggest problems in the school? Where is your favorite place for you know, group study? What's your favorite place in the school, least favorite? Different things like that. So we've been working on interpreting the results, and we have a meeting on Thursday, I believe, where we're going to, there were a lot of really answers that showed up very frequently. Um, a, lot, a lot of students had similar answers. So we're working on different ways to kind of develop different initiatives from that survey. And can you think of anything else? Um, we've been telling students about um, to take the uh, drug policy survey that you guys put out. and. Uh, so far, there's been little success, but hopefully um, <laughs> we'll get at least the SAC to take it and maybe some students who, who are interested in the results. Um, I think that's about it for now. Yeah. Um, we'll probably have more things come up at the Thursday meeting. Great. I think okay. one thing we don't want to forget, even though Dick Mullen isn't going to be here tonight, is to congratulate everyone who participated in Beauty and the Beast particularly one of the stars who's sitting up here with us. If you 
I hope each of you got a chance to see at least one performance of it. It was just amazing. Uh, every piece of it, including the students who came from Pond Cove and performed at the same time. But it was, it was eight performances, very well done. I went the very last night, and it was just superb. So I congratulate you. Thank you. And I congratulate all who participated. And I know we'll talk more about it in January. Thank you. Um, moving on to comments from the public on non-agenda items. Is there one, anyone here from the public to comment on non-agenda items? Seeing none, we'll move on to recognition. Um, Alan, middle school drama club is what you're postponing till January? I don't, uh, no, Steve? That was me. Oh, okay, it was you. Okay, thank you. I'm I knew sorry. somebody was going to do it. Um, you gave a great segue, Alan. I, wanted to um, recognize Evan Solander and Steve Price and all the middle school students who participated in the night shows performance that took place early November, I guess. Um, it was just terrific. And it, it was a great effort by the students, um, those two faculty members, as well as the families of those students. So um, great job. It was a wonderful production. Great. Thank you. Now it's the high school. And that will be in That's the, the one. OK. A little bit I gave to it. And I have the information on the Interact Club, but of course I can't find it. Um, maybe we could move on to the athletic teams and bleacher update while I look for it. Okay, Jeff is not here yet, and he's going to speak to that, but I have a rec. Oh, you found it. Okay, so why? I did you find it. it. Yep. Okay. Okay, um, I wanted to uh, recognize the uh, Interact Club that we have at the high school right now. I emailed uh, Chris Newell, and she sent me information. Uh, and I'll just read what she wrote. She wrote, in, in mid-September, two members helped with the Rotary's bike rally in South Portland. At the end of September and in, into October, the club members ran a campaign on short notice, coloring for Kenya, collecting coloring books, colored pencils, erasers, sharpeners, etc., and money for children's medicine to send with the Rotarians to the Kenyan orphanage. Also, at the end of October, some members did reverse trick-or-treating in an attempt to recruit new members. <laughs> in November, we raked lawns to raise money for members to attend the main Interact Conference at Freiburg Academy in January. December is helping with the tree sale in Mill Creek. More than half of the members have already signed up to participate. And I can attest that that's a lot of fun selling trees. We have already agreed to sponsor Blood Tribe on March 26 and have offered to help with the Relay for, Lo for Life in South Portland High School in June. We have several more activities penciled in at this time a fundraiser for Relay for, Rife in Jan Relay for Life in January, Valentine's in February, Mother's Day Bake and Carnation Sale in May to defray the cost of another sophomore attending the Rotary Youth Leadership Camp. Um, and that's all I have for that. So while we wait for Jeff, I do have one more, one more piece, if you don't mind. This is a recognition. Um, and what I would say to you in the beginning is, if you go to the school board's website, if you open the school board section, if you go to the policies, if you go to the B section, uh, which is about school board, and then you find the BDB section, you'll have reached the description of board officers, and most specifically, the duties of the chair of the school board. This is the document. I won't read it all to you at this point, but this is the document. I will not take the time to read it to you, but I, it is a constant reminder of the management of the day-to-day -day work of the full school board and all the expectations connected with being the chair. Kathy Ray has been a member of the school board since November of 2003. As a lifelong resident of Cape Elizabeth, as a business leader, and as one who cares about educating young people, she came to the board as someone who honors those who do their work and their jobs well, truly exhibit knowledge, instructional skills, caring young people, and those who exemplify the true role of school personnel. During the past two years, she has been an extremely effective school board chair, and I will take a few minutes to talk about her work. She understands that the school board member is an elected official who serves without pay, uh, that must be willing to give every bit of her time and her energy necessary to provide strong leadership. Managing the ex expectations of the board as a reflective student and education is extremely important. Avoiding issues that are not clearly defined is not part of her management style. 
She sees board members as a part of the working process, that they are not blind leaders. Kathy knows that hiring a superintendent who will maintain the excellence of our schools and who will continue to build a strong school system is imperative. She also knows that providing leadership without micromanagement is a key to the system's success. She sees the school board as the guiding light of the schools and that by working together, the members of the board set realistic goals, have strong expectations, and honor and encourage those who give hours and hours of their time to strongly guide the system as a learning community. Listening, understanding, discussing, negotiating, and recognizing the steps necessary to ensure that all aspects of the school system are recognized is the basic of our success. When Kathy sees issues, she clearly recognizes that moving forward is the work of the entire board. Kathy carefully manages the, board, the management of the board. She cares and she understands that the board's effectiveness involves seven dedicated officials, or in the last few months, six dedicated officials. As superintendent, I know she understands the need for organization, clear planning, careful financial oversight, town and school needs. She respects highly qualified teachers and the demands of their work, and also recognizes the best support staff members, including building administrators, central office personnel, secretaries, custodians, maintenance, food services, transportation, all of whom provide bright lights in the lives of our students. Kathy is also always aware when my voice and my work moves the superintendent's model to the teaching model, and that does cause jitters in here at times. Kathy knows the basis of all of our work is children, and we do all we can to provide a solid education while keeping in mind the financial limitations of a community. She sees education as a people business and does not get lost with other issues in the process of being a quality board member. Kathy recognizes Cape Elizabeth as a full community. She avoids taking sides, but listens to all citizens. Although she knows that many identify this community as being populated by the very wealthy, she understands that there is truly a broad variety of people who live in the community, and that the economics of living in this community must be consistently monitored. Cape Elizabeth has a school system that elicits great pride and provides strong educational programs for each individual student. In summary, Kathy knows that the schools must be the center of knowledge, skills, behaviors, and attitudes, and teachers need to set the model and provide the strong, focused instruction. She believes that every student should benefit from each day uh, he or she attends Cape Elizabeth schools. Every person working in the school system needs to see each student as an individual and take pride in the educational opportunities they offer to those individuals. Kathy, it is great honor to be honoring you tonight as you leave after two years as chair of the board. Uh, you do truly care about Cape Elizabeth, its schools and its young people, and you will be proud of the leaders that come out of the system now. So may I just move for a moment? Because I have a gift for you to recognize your time with the board. Here's something that I hope you can put on your wall as a remembrance of the years that you spent as board chair and the years now and in the coming years that you spend as a board member. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I was a little shocked when I looked up and saw my family in the back row. It kind of threw me for a minute. There. So she wrote me a note and asked me why you were here. And she said, I said, I don't know. And she said I was a liar. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you very yes. much. I appreciate that. I, um, I, was, I thought to myself I, I should say something at the end of the meeting tonight, you know, because I thought, oh, this is my last meeting as chair, so I should say something nice. So I wrote down a couple notes, and I'm sort of thinking about doing that, and you, you, you really uh, sort of took me. But I, I did want to thank the board for um, allowing me the honor of being the chair for the last two years. I've 
really enjoyed it, and um, I really appreciate it. I really consider it a huge honor. And uh, I've enjoyed working with Alan and his staff and the district leadership team. I think you've got a, an amazing group of people that work at this school. And, uh, and uh, so anyway, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Okay, now I'm supposed to <clears throat> get back to uh, business here. So uh, anyway. <laughs> Wave to the family, right? <laughs> um, okay, I, I can do this. Uh, moving on to communication. Uh, Alan, budget. Yes. Uh, this evening I want to talk with you for a few minutes, probably several minutes, about budget. Uh, I did send to you this afternoon by email a uh, document that I put together that just gives an overview of where the budget is. Uh, and I also have some other pieces I'd like to add to this. First of all, I'd like to start with the 2008-2009 budget, the current budget, the one we're working under right now. Uh, if you have been watching television carefully and watching the newspapers, you know that there is a $27 million deficit that has been earmarked to be taken care of by school systems in Maine. The governor has spoken to that issue. The Department of Education has sent out information about that issue. But basically what it shows us is that the state revenue that we received, or were supposed to receive this year, of $3,075,609.89, is going to be decreased by 13.7%. Uh, and therefore, we will, if all the steps happen in sequence, lose $421,572 from our budget in the 08-09 year. Uh, the legislature, the new legislature I just found out tonight, has been sworn in and they go into session tomorrow. And they begin to look at this because the governor cannot curtail school budgets. It has to be a decision of the legislature. So they go into session tomorrow to look at this situation. My understanding is that that's, uh, the amount of money that we are in deficit has grown considerably since then. So I don't know what the final verdict will be. There are, there are at least three possible things that could happen. And I, I say very clearly, could happen. Number one, this legislature that goes into session tomorrow could, during the month of December, decide not to do a curtailment. In order to do that, they've got to find funds in other places in order to make that amount up. I have been in contact with all four legislators from this area. I uh, sent them the material as we've received them so they are well informed as they go into the debates that happen tomorrow. The second thing that could happen is that they could vote a curtailment that the Department of Education would do, which is the one that was sent in a spreadsheet, which would be the 13.7% for Cape Elizabeth and would be the $421,572. They could vote to do that during the 0809 year. And so it would come out of this current budget. They could also look at it and possibly take it into July of 2009 in the new budget year. I think you realize as well as I do, if they take into 2009, we will already start with a $421,000 deficit. If they do it now, we are in some very difficult times. Because that amount of money, $421,572, is not money that is setting in the budget to be deleted. Currently, as you know, I have frozen our budgets. I have frozen them very solid. I am not approving any spending at all except for paying salaries, fringe benefits, and any bills that have come on a regular basis because of commitments we have made prior to this. All spending as far as supplies, equipment, uh, travel, etc., have been frozen. And as of this week, I have taken it one step further and I am not allowing any additional spending whatsoever. My reason for that is this. When we finalized the budget this past year, you will remember that at the uh, level that we funded it, we put in $70,000 for contingency. In a budget that is over $19 million, $70,000 is a fairly small amount of money. That money at this point in time has not been touched and therefore would probably be the first amount of money we would have to put towards 
this deficit. Then we will have to look at the uh, supplies, equipment, et cetera. We are very much aware that we've had five months of a school year. Much of that money has been spent as we got ready to go into the school year. The next step we are taking a look at is programs in the system. I am very clear in the fact that we could, if we have to cut $421,572, I could very easily be coming back to you during the early, late winter, early spring to talk about the possibility of cutting positions in this school system. That is not a happy situation. I've talked with Michael McGovern, and he, and he has talked with the town council. They're very much aware of this situation, and they are doing some thinking around how they may be able to help out. Uh, I am waiting to hear what happens in Augusta. Uh, I also understand that the uh, commissioner is looking at uh, mandates that are unfunded and to see if some of those can be cut to save some dollars for individual school systems. But I, I need to stress that this is an extremely difficult process. It is not going to be an easy process. Uh, I have talked with other superintendents who are already talking with their staffs also about possibly cutting positions during the school year uh, and other ways that they're going to get to this. Some of these school systems have hundreds of thousands of dollars of contingency and are still working around this. Uh, we have $70,000. Now, to make it very clear, this is still in action. There is still work being done on it. Needless to say, I have looked at every part of our budget, not only for 0809, but also for 0910 and what it looks like. But I need to say to you that in the next few weeks, we will hopefully be getting some results from the new legislature in order to understand what our commitment is going to be and what it will cost us in order to get to uh, June 30th of 2009. Uh, it is not an easy proposition. I can't sit here tonight, nor would I try to sit here tonight and say, you're going to cut this and this and this and this. I need to know first if that is going to be the plan that we need to live by, and then we go from there. However, I am also, oh, and I might mention that in the documents that I passed to you, I did add the section about school loss calculations that you got the other day from Maine School Management and the Department of Education. I did add that to this just so you can look at it again because you do need to remember that part of this process has been to change the minimum local mill rate requirement from 6.55 to 6.79 or it increases by 24 cents per thousand property value. Uh, so these, these are the figures that they have used. It is based on the valuation of your community and based on the number of kids and the changing population, either going up or down. And as you are very much aware, because you've seen tonight's uh, population figures again, we continue to drop in population. With that in mind, we are now in the process of beginning to look at a 0910 budget. The first step of that is the superintendent's budget. Uh, again, we are looking at some pretty serious information here. Very much aware, and Michael has uh, sent a, a document along tonight, which you will have on your computers when you get home, talking about the declines that are coming because of ex low excise tax, reduced investment income, falling building permit fees, and other small pieces to the puzzle, which is already showing that the town will be at least at a 10.4% decrease in what they had this year. He also has talked about obligations for next year for expenses that will be, he'll have to handle because of health insurance, workers' comp, negotiated pay increases, et cetera. I look at those same pictures. I look at it from the perspective of we all work very hard to have the very best school system we can have. Best school system costs money. We have negotiated contracts. At this point in time, looking at the negotiated contracts which we have, and all negotiated contracts have been settled except for administrators, and also for your people who work in central office who do not have contracts. 
but based on the current level of the contracts resolved and a change in the insurance, health insurance process. In the past, we have always done health insurance as paying the previous year. This past year in negotiating with teachers, we have moved to the current year. So we are now in a process of trying to estimate what our health insurance will be. Uh, the current is at 4%. We are very much aware that when it falls that low, it also can take a very quick turnaround to go very high. In talking with business managers across the state, we are, we are working with them and we are doing estimates of health insurance at 18 to 20%. We could be high. I hope we're not low. And we know we'll have to make some adjustments, but we also know that we don't get strong health insurance information until February or March or possibly even April. So with the money that we know we would need to maintain our current level of staffing in the school system, if we had a zero base budget, or 0910, if that is the decision the community makes, we would be shot $1,112,000 in our budget at zero base. If you take a look at that amount of money and you take a look at what it will cost in order to bring that down so that we can operate a school system, that will involve many decisions around staffing from my office to buildings to programs, et cetera. If we get a 3% budget, we would still be shot $518,400 in order to pay salaries for the staffing that we have at this time. Now we will look at all pieces <coughs> of the puzzle. We will look at all the equipment, we will look at all of the supplies, we will look at every piece of the budget. But I need to tell you that these are, these are very dangerous times and it is not going to be easy. I have given directives to the administrators, I met with them yesterday. I have uh, listened to what some of you have said. I have not at this point been given a goal as far as money goes either by the board or by the town council. What the dis discussions have been is that it is important that we look at our budgets based on the future direction plan that we have. What is our mission? What is our vision? What are our goals? And what is our working plan? And so we're doing that very carefully. We are, I've also talked to them about doing a zero base budget and I want to qualify that very quickly. When I say a zero base budget, I'm not asking administrators to take their budget to zero dollars and work out. What I'm saying is you have got to take a look at every piece of your school or your program. You have got to look at it from the perspective of what services and what skills do they provide in instruction for staff? And we have to look at that carefully. I've talked with other areas. I've talked with maintenance. Uh, information is going out to, got to custodians. I have talked with food service. I have talked with every transportation. I've talked with every possible area. Beginning uh, Thursday, I'm starting to have staff meetings with all staff in the system. One of the things I'm going to talk about with them is, in times like this, times that have not been happened in school systems, in my 41 years in a school system, one of the things we have to look at is, is there, are there ways we get out of the box? Do we do the same things over and over? Uh, yesterday I spent some time at the high school, and one of the questions I was asked immediately was, so, are you the free substitute that we are going to have now since we can't afford to have subs? They had read the article in the Sunday paper from Westbrook and what is going on there. We are going to be faced because of the national economy, because of the state losses, we are going to be faced with a very difficult process this next year. Uh, we are beginning to put this budget together. First week in January, all of my administrators will be meeting with me and with Pauline to talk about their budgets as they are now. What they have been asked to do is to put together a budget that reflects what they feel is most needed for their schools. They, they have to write a scenario about why they're making these decisions and how it connects to the future planning of the school system. 
And we will gather that information. We will do the statistics. We will see what we have for a total budget request. And then I will need to go back in a step-by-step -step process under your guidance to decide where we are going to come out as the bottom line of the budget. So there are some difficult steps ahead, some difficult steps that I'm going to be need, needing to refer back to you over and over again as we go through this process. I will be very clear with you. Again, I've been in education for 41 years. I never remember school systems being at this state and in this situation. I always hope that somebody will come up with a magic formula and a magic dollar and it will take care of it. But I'm very afraid that that is not going to happen. So, in, in summary, I do not have a list to give to you tonight to say this is what we're going to spend and this is what we're going to cut and this is where we're going to go. What I need to do is to work with you <coughs> excuse me, closely <coughs> excuse me, to look at the, the money we're talking about, to look at the programs, and to look what may be needed. I have talked with the, boy, with the administrators about the possibility of going to each one of them with a cut of a certain percent. And if we do that, that cut will be equitable in all areas, from the superintendent's office to the schools to programs, etc. Now, I will be honest with you, I have not planned to present as much of this tonight as I am, but I am doing it now because I think you need to understand that there is an enormous amount of time, effort, energy, and sleepless nights going on as we begin to gear up for what we know is going to be difficult work. I need to sit with you as a board to begin to talk about ideas that you have that may be something we haven't even thought about because we're stuck in one box, and how do we do that? But in the, in the long run, in the bottom line, as I look at two students sitting there, and I think of students here tonight, and students that I have talked with in the, every day, I know that our baseline is to provide the best we can for students within the financial realm of what money is available. And so those are the steps that we'll be taking in order to get to where we're going, uh, both for 08, 09, and then 9, 10, and what that, that total picture will look like. I would accept any, I'd be happy to try to answer any questions that I can at this point, but I felt tonight it is extremely important that you do understand the struggle that is ahead of us. Rebecca? I have a lot of questions, Alan, so mm -hmm. I'm going to sure. apologize now. Sure. Um, what is our goal for when we're going to have a hand? If, assuming worst case, what is our goal in terms of a timeline for our worst case scenario situation where we're going to have to cut the $410,000? By when do we have to have decided what those cuts are going to be? My sense is, and I can only say my sense because I, I can't guarantee you how the legislature is going to work, but my understanding is the legislature needs to make this decision in the month of December as far as what that's going to be. So that then all of us as superintendents across the state can step back and say, okay, this is where we are, this is what we need to do. So my sense is I would probably be meeting with you in early January to begin to take a look at what are those cuts going to look like. Because if I understand correctly, mm -hmm. you've put a freeze on any spending, not um, salary or benefits mm -hmm. and energy costs mm -hmm. that we'd have to pay sure. for. Um, roughly, how much is that going to save us? My sense is nowhere near $421,000. Nowhere near that. Uh, again, we have got $70,000 in contingency. We have got about $100,000 more or less in the areas of equipment, uh, supplies. supplies, and those types of things. Uh, we have got some money in staff development, uh, but it probably right now is a approximately twenty to twenty two thousand dollars and that's that's all because of the different things we've had to we've been working on as the year started. So so we are we are we are not at a point 
where there is $471,000 out there above salaries and benefits. So then my question is, because yeah. reading, reading the papers, um, a comment from one of the other districts yeah. superintendent was, um, we're not going to really get a lot of savings from layoffs because we have to pay 90 days. Mm -hmm. um, we have to give 90 days notice. 90 days notice. Yeah. To teachers. So if we wait and, <coughs> okay, to teachers. To teachers. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, it depends on the contract that we have, correct? Yeah, definitely. Um, so it's contract and state law. Okay. Yeah. Uh, are other employees covered by that same state law? Not in the same, like, the number of days, no. Okay. No. But let's just say it's 90 days. If we don't get anything put together until mid-January, late January, it's February, March, April, you're talking two, two months of salary. Mm -hmm. How much is that really going to save us? Unless we lay off everybody. <laughs> and no school for May and June. It's, it's interesting you say that, because I've had people ask me that question. You know, is there a point where we look at fewer school days in the year? Is there a point where we look at other manner of getting through this process? Yeah, it's a, it's a very serious mm -hmm. question. Sure, I mean, it definitely is. We, it, we're talking as if there's lots of um, ways to be creative about our cuts, but I'm not so sure there is that many creative ways, given that we have a 90-day um, waiting period, um, for teachers at least, and there's probably a waiting period for the other staff. There members. is shorter waiting periods. It's shorter, but there's still another yeah. waiting period. And there period. are some people who are not under a contract, but under an agreement, mm -hmm. which can be severed at any moment. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other question I have, do you guys mind? I just kind of go through it because I'll get law. Um, another question that I have is we usually have a carry forward balance that we apply to the next budget. Um, is there anything that prevents us from accessing that balance in this year? I think the first thing we need to talk about is the fact that our carry forward balance is going to be much smaller this coming year than it is this year. Yeah. Uh, number two, uh, there are pieces to that puzzle we can look at, but what we're going to have to do with you as a board is to have, take a look at both 0809 and 910 because anything we use in 0809 will not be revenue for 910 and therefore will also mean a deeper cut for that year above and beyond where we are now. So that, I'm not saying that can't be done. I'm just saying that is a piece to that puzzle that we, we need well, to Well, of course, that, that carry forward balance is actually util, utilized to reduce the um, impact on taxes. Right. It's not necessarily right. yep. an expenditure reduction, it is a tax buffer. Yep. It's, so it's my question well. would be, if we could at least find out whether that carry forward balance is accessible for this, um, ex this current year. Um, okay, the next question I have is fuel. I've raised this before, <clears throat> but I'm going to raise it again. Sure. Um, it keeps plummeting and plummeting and plummeting. And from what I can understand by doing a very surface research is that by state law, the oil dealers are required to purchase 75% of the contract, the current contracts that they have, and that they get at that point in time. That gives them a 25% margin that can be played with. Um, I would really strongly urge our business manager and um, maintenance manager to approach our fuel supply um, company and say, we, we, you know, we really could use some help. We are one of your biggest customers. Um, we know that you are, are required, constrained by law, but we, we also know that there is this 25% margin. Can you please help us out in any way? A dollar is a dollar. I mean, at this point, we'll take whatever we can get. You're right. You're and, you know, instead right. of just closing the door saying, no, we can't do it, I really think we need to have that conversation in a very serious, forceful manner. Um, okay. My next question. That actually wasn't a question. I apologize. <laughs> that, was <laughs> that was a statement. Um, sorry. Uh, have you been speaking with other superintendents? Yes, I have. Um, are they, is anybody talking about districts um, 
questioning the uh, very large impact that's being felt in education in the state of Maine, and how does that compare to other state spending categories? Um, I, I know DOT is funded so differently, but I, I'm not, you know, I know DHS is getting quite hit, but there must be other areas, and what are they getting um, in terms of cuts? And um, I mean, are these questions being asked by the uh, MSMA, the Superintendents Association, anybody else? Those questions are being asked, and we also have figures uh, that came out uh, last month as far as why, how each of these areas is being hit as a percentage. But clearly, the focus is on education and Department of, of Health and Human Services because we are the two largest receivers. Mm -hmm. And so we have seen the biggest cuts. Mm -hmm. There are cuts in all areas uh, based upon how much is spent in that area. Uh, I will tell you, just be, to answer your question also, uh, the Cumberland County Superintendents are meeting next, not this Thursday, but next Thursday uh, with our lawyers from German Woodsum uh, and working with experts from there to talk about this problem. And then I also just received, just before this meeting, I was upstairs looking, uh, I have also just received notification from the State Superintendents Association that we will also be meeting with economists who will be coming in to take a look at other ways that we can, we can work with this at this point in time. Mm -hmm. We're all at a stage, I can tell you this in the conversations I've had, we're all at a stage of looking at our budgets. Each of us has a little different effect in our budgets based on what they are. And if you saw the spreadsheet, you know that this, the amount to be lost uh, ranges from less than $100,000 up to well over a million dollars. Yeah. And so we're each looking at it and looking at what are the other possibilities. And you did see in the Sunday paper, uh, Stan Sawyer, who is the superintendent of Westbrook, was talking about some of the things they're doing because of the large amount that they are in the process of losing at this point in time. Right. Um, I, I think the other question that kind of associated with that is, if, how is it possible that DHS can absorb a $34, 34 million dollar cut without affecting services, and yet education takes a 20, uh, 20 point seven million cut, and 20 million of that is directly going to educational services. Why is there such a gross discrepancy between those two departments? The reason being, a lot of this employer in the state of Maine is the Department of Human Services. They're simply going to lay off people. That's not true of the Department of Education. Well, well they are going to, so, that, so all of these people that they're going to lay off, 34 million, have no contact with services. They have contacts. The services are still going to exist, Rebecca. They're just going to be done very poorly. Uh, okay. For example, sense. the average aspire caseworker has 175 clients. Yeah. They're going to start laying off aspire caseworkers. So the caseworkers will then have 300 clients. So, so the they, services will still exist. They can still put on their little so dog and pony show. They say it doesn't show. impact the, services. Yeah. It's not really quite what they mean. No. Right. Mm, okay. It's, it's like with the whole budget thing. We've been getting little pieces of information for a year. No one wanted to talk about the gorilla in the room. Well, now the gorilla is here. Yeah. Okay. Last question. Can I just also comment on what Peter just said? Is if you look at it from education, we'll be doing basically the same thing. Right. We'll be having programs, but instead of having 18 or 20 kids in your class, you may have 45. Right. It's, that, it's that same idea. Well, with the Department of Education, they're not cutting educational services. They're just cutting our funding. We're going to be the bad asses that cut services. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. It's not the state's fault. Remember, remember that. Okay. I'll try. Okay, and last question. Thank you everyone for your patience. Um, this is a little bit of a um, touchy subject, but um, I think it might behoove us. We have, we have, this has come up in previous discussions because we've come under, we've, we've been dodging bullets left and right for every year I've been on this board. Mm -hmm. Um, I and uh, we, I think the first time it came up was around Pulaski or Tabor, the second time was around consolidation, but I think we need, if for, if for no other purposes than to resolve the, um, whether there is the potential to consider privatization or not. And I don't know if the board would be interested in doing that. I, I think it would be worthwhile to undergo an analysis, not necessarily at this moment, try to make a decision, but just determine, is this really feasible or not? Economically, programmatically, legally, um, 
because certainly every time I find out that we're losing another $500,000 or $300,000 in state funding, I keep going, why are we in this? <laughs> we keep, we're, we're being told what we have to do, but we keep getting our money being pulled. So I'd like to kind of throw it out to the board um, and to you, Alan, mm -hmm. as to whether it makes sense to just do the analysis, um, the, kind of come to a findings, a conclusion of whether this is something we can even consider or not. If I could speak to it for just a minute and then can go on from the board, is that you'll remember when we were talking about joining an RSU and whether we would join with South Portland or somewhere else, the issue of privatization also came up at that point. At that point, I also understood that there was a small town in coastal Maine that was trying to see if the law could be changed to give them the opportunity to privatize. It is my understanding that at that point in time, that did not happen. And so I know from that law then but I can't speak of today, and so it's a piece we would have to research, is that at that point then, there was no law in the state that would allow a public school setting to privatize. And I think the other thing you would need to look at, and therefore I think Rebecca's right, you would need to do some pretty serious investigation, is that if you decide, if you could privatize and you decide to privatize, you do need to remember that automatically you will lose, although it's being cut this year, you could still lose about 300,000, uh, 300, excuse me, you could still use about $3 million in state subsidy that would be lost. And I also look at a community like Cape Elizabeth, where yes, you have some families who, who probably would see that as a good way to go, but I think you have a lot of families in this town who would find that as a very difficult situation. But, I would say to you as a board, if you decide that you would like to research that, I think it's important. I think it would be important to have a committee uh, to do that and to begin to look at the things. I think at this point in time, for us to begin to look at that as administrators would be very difficult in the situation we're in now as far as budgeting. But if you are interested, then I think you would have to make that decision and decide what your guidelines would be to set that up. I think the question is, we would lose the three million, although it's less than that now, and it's probably going to be even more less than yep. that the oh, next probably year. Is. Yep. Um, it's it's the net. So yes, we would lose that. But how much do we not have to pay in terms of expenses? I know that there was a very rough analysis done uh, at some point, and I, I, I forgive me, Pauline, I could not find it anywhere in my notes. I know you're the one who did that work, um, but I do remember it not being. Uh, being at a substantial enough figure where it didn't make sense, but that's kind of, and that's kind of where the conversation stopped. But with every year that we receive less and less from the state, I think it would be just good to kind of know roughly what is that benchmark that has to be crossed where it becomes economically feasible, um, and whether it's legally feasible. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure we need to be looking for a law that allows us to privatize, but rather, are there any laws that prevent us from privatizing? Questions, comments? I was just going to comment. I think one of my concerns with the concept of privatization is not, um, has more to do with that, shifting that, that tax burden even more so on the people in the community. So even though I know you're talking about the net versus the three million and then the expenses involved in staying with the state and the mandates and everything else, I would be curious what that number boils down to um, and how significant it is. But whether or not it's a couple million or 700, that still is a significant chunk as we're seeing just from this playing out with the 427 or whatever, $421,000 currently and the impact that's gonna have. So I wouldn't wanna do something that could damage our schools even more, um, although we would wanna reflect upon the long-term benefits of being autonomous and stuff like that, which I think there's some merit to that. I think everything that we have on our plate right now, it would be probably my preference to focus on getting through this very challenging economic time, and we've got a lot of work cut out for us as it is, so I probably wouldn't want to focus our energies just like I thought consolidation distracted us for a big chunk of time, and I don't think I wanna be consumed by something that might not, um, be beneficial, and I mean, if it's not gonna to come to fruition, I don't wanna spend a lot of time doing that unless there's some real, if we can do a quick analysis and see that there might be some financial merit to it. Yeah, I mean, I, I really don't see this as taking a super amount of long time, because it's, I don't, 
I don't see it being a debate about educationally appropriate, you know, that kind of thing. It's more just simply, are there the laws? It, what about, for another question that came up in my mind is, what about the buildings that we're in? You know, can we, are those buildings owned and controlled by the state? Um, and then the other issue is around the economic analysis. So, I mean, I think, I, I don't, see it as being a long drawn out process for the f this fact finding part of it. Um, it only would become probably more drawn out if it turned out to be that it is possible and feasible and then it, then it opens up the whole other questions about is that something we really want to do. And, and you know whether when that, hap when that conversation happens I'm not necessarily, I'm not even there yet. I'm just like is this feasible or not? And if not let's, let me, I, let me can just put that aside and Every time more bad news arrives, I won't, I, my, my flights of fancy won't go there. Um, I had one question that I wanted to raise, and maybe Pauline, you're the person to um, answer this to. I mean, I know we have our contingency fund currently of the $70,000. It primarily was set aside for things like energy, increase in energy costs, and things like this. And the state reneging on sort of a commitment, in my opinion, financially was unexpected, but probably understandable given everything that's going on in the economy. What kind of contingency fund? Um, does the town have currently on the municipal side, or do they have money set aside like we have? I would assume they do. They have an undesignated fund balance. Um, I don't know, I'm talking about that, but that is not the they do have a significant amount. I mean, is it a couple hundred thousand dollars? Is it significantly higher? Or is it, do, we have a, do you have a, a general sense of um, how big it is? Okay. I guess my, my question would be, um, it, it would be nice, and I understand we're working with the town manager, but maybe realizing that we're going to really have to think quite seriously about going forward decisions we're going to have to make, um, given the fact that this is something that was thrown to us and we had done a responsible job budgeting for the year, depending on certain things coming in, especially from the state. Maybe that's a conversation under the one town concept that we have more seriously with our town manager, um, whether or not that would be an appropriate use of some of those funds to help us in a time of more or less crisis before we start wiping out programs and staff, realizing we might still need to make some of those, you know, look very hard at that for the following year. So I would hope as, as a one town concept that we could have those conversations with the municipal side. And I would tell you very clearly that Michael has been very open to discuss this with me and has also started the discussions with the town council. And so he, uh, the chair of the town council and the chair of their finance committee, uh, have had begun to have some of these conversations. They're kind of stuck in the same position I'm in at this point. We've got to see, first of all, what the bottom line is going to be. If you remember, when we first heard this, we thought we were going to lose about $250,000. And it suddenly changed to a much larger sum. And so those are all pieces to the puzzle we're working on as well. And I, and I want to be very clear in this, is that uh, the town manager has been very open to any discussions about that. I've been extremely pleased with the conversations I've had with him and some of the conversations he's had with his town council members. Great. You know, this it gets me thinking, this begs the question of if, you, if we go back, if when we do our budgets, um, the kind of the way we approach it is expenditure based mm -hmm. because we know that funding from the state can fluctuate up or down. Um, and in the good years, of which I think there's been one, we got, we got additional funding. Um, the tax rate was positively impacted by that, and there were some savings. Um, but in the years that we have reduced funding, the tax rate gets negatively affected by that. And wouldn't this actually fall under that concept? I mean, I'm not sure how much of a difference this really is. We're getting less money from the state. Unfortunately, getting less money from the state in a, in a fiscal year that's already half, almost half done, too, right. which is even a greater problem for us. Here. I apologize for being chicken little once again, but I don't think there's anyone in this room that believes the fourth quarter of this calendar year is going to be any better than the third quarter was. It is indeed going to be worse. Uh, the economists that I trust and the actuaries that I trust have 
at best that it's going to level off by the end of next summer. So I just think that before the end of the calendar year, we're going to be facing a million dollar shortfall and we're going to be facing at least a million dollar shortfall in next calendar year. And we have to be proactive about that. I'm thankful for the town manager's comments to me the other day when I met with him on the Christmas tree lot that we are still one town. We'll find a way to get through this. Uh, and I'm, I'm very thankful that the town council is thinking that way. But I'm also surprised that the board itself hasn't met already on this matter. It's very important that we act as quickly as possible. And I know it's frustrating that you can't make final decisions because you don't know what the final revenue figures are. I do have one question for our superintendent. Are we allowed under law to reopen contracts in regards to the sharing of benefits? I've been asked that several times. Uh, my sense is that you, you can ask if they will consider it. I'm also ha handing out information in hopes that there will be some consideration of that. But I think you are, as a board, in a position where you could request a discussion about the reopening of contracts. I know Portland did last yeah. year. Yep. Yeah. Uh, but I'd much rather pay another $25 a week towards my Blue Cross than lose my job. Mm -hmm. And I'm not trying to speak for our town employees and staff, but it, it just seems something that's more palatable than layoffs due to a RIF because we simply don't have the money to hit salaries. And the other thing is I don't think we should anticipate receiving a great deal of guidance and help from our delegation in Augusta because the political fact is the majority of them represent the city of South Portland. And if you think we have trouble, they're four times worse off than us as far as total dollars lost. So that, just politically, that's where they, the majority of our legislative delegation is, is going to be working to try to save the city of South Portland school system. And I actually would like to, I'm really glad you brought up the topic of reopening the contract negotiations because I think it's a very sensitive topic, but I think this is an appropriate time to seriously consider and maybe make that request or come together as a board and determine whether or not that's something we would like to do with them. I think we should, you know, as Karen just said, I think we should stop talking about it openly and stop hiding behind the contracts because we're actually protecting jobs if we do reopen. No, I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think one of the, the, one of the things that is, is probably very difficult, probably not understood by people who haven't been in education, is this is the first time, again, that I know of in 41 years where we've been in this situation. And so, you know, consideration of all of the different possibilities have to be open, wide open. But I think, Peter, you made a really good point, too, that I think is one, as a board, you need to, we need to think about, you need to think about and work with me on it is, I think as a board, we need to sit in a meeting just about negotiation. Let me take that back. Sit in a meeting just about budgeting and what are the steps we're going to take. Because I will tell you, and I'm, I'm very honest about this, this budgeting process can be a very lonely process when you're not sure where everyone wants to go. And so I, I, I think it is extremely important. Uh, I think I remember saying in my little speech about Kathy that one of the things we have to do is, is give the time and energy to really look deeply into what we're doing and how we're doing it. I truly, truly will say to you that I am shooting with the best possible information that I have at this point. But the information that you have, the concerns that you have as a board, of uh, six right now and of seven after next week are going to be very important as we work our way through this process. I think one of the things we have to do this for the remainder of this year and next year is we have to start doing our own revenue projections and making them very honest, unlike the state of Maine, as to before we even discuss budget, we have to know how much money we have to spend, whether it be through taxation, through funding from the town council, through funding from the state, through funding from federal government. I need to know how much money we have available. And I think that's the biggest change we're ever going to face as a school board is we never had to do revenue-based budgets before. And, and now I think we have to. So maybe the board can, we don't have to necessarily do it right now, but maybe you could throw out some sure. dates where the board could get together as a whole and we could have those conversations. Does that make sense if Alan puts out like three or four times? And cause it's, I think it's important that we all be there. Um, so is that, is that satisfied? Mm -hmm. Other questions or comments for, for Alan or in the budget, about the budget? I, the only thing that I would say is 
I look at two student members that we have here who are probably are realizing at the same time they have come onto the board at very difficult times. There's no question about it. And uh, it's going to be difficult discussions. But I've, I have listened to this board say many times we need to hear from all segments of our population. One segment of our population is students. Some of the students in your building are voting age. Some will be a voting age soon. And so I think some of the discussions we're having now will be very important discussions to have with students. And I will just put this out. I have offered to every administrator, and I would offer to you. I'm very glad to come to the buildings to talk with students, uh, to talk with staff. I'm going to be meeting with some staff this week and next week. I'm very happy to do that because I think we need to have a community understand the situation we're in at this point in time. Um, I think, you know, Sarah and I will do our best to kind of understand what's going on. This is nothing that I really, you know, I'm trying grasping at straws, but um, it would be, I think it would be really wonderful if you came and talked to um, the SAC and gave us, uh, I guess, this little talk, maybe uh, with less technical jargon. Um, <laughs> but um, I think that would be really, really helpful. Do you have a date and a time? Um, this? We meet this Thursday, but I think that that's like a specific. We have something specific to do that on. Um, could we talk, could we talk to Marissa about? Yeah, we can talk on Thursday. We can talk with the rest of the and SAC and get yeah, back to you. Um, I think it is really important for students to understand what's going on because I know, especially like last year during the budget process, everyone just sort of had this idea that people were out there arbitrarily making cuts, not really, you know, thinking there was no real specific reason why. So I think that's something that every student should really understand so they know what's going on. And I think that's an important point for you to make because what I do find, not only with just students, but a lot of people in the community think that $19 million has all kinds of extra money to play with, and it doesn't. <laughs> and I think that's a, that's a hard lesson that teachers are going to learn, everybody who works in the system is going to learn, as well as the people in the community. So the more information I can get out, the more honest information I can get out, I think it is very important that we do that. Can I just get some clarity on whether the board is at all interested in perhaps the finance committee doing some research on privatization or not? If it's research, if, if you're just doing the research at this point, I agree with Karen and also picking up on Alan's comment, I think there are, I think it's worth doing some fact finding. If the finance, I would support the finance committee doing some initial fact finding at this point, um, just to see whether it's feasible before we commit resources and energy to go even further. Because there's a whole host of questions that are running through my head. Um, so I don't have a problem with the finance committee using its resources without sort of drawing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. energy away from other things yeah. um, to pursue that. It's, a, it's not committing anybody to anything. Others agree, disagree? I agree as long as we don't tax the time of our superintendent and our business manager. We're going into a budget and that's where we need them. I did know that. I'll get on that. Okay. Okay. Does that? Looks like I'll be researching. <laughs> 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 Dr. Rebecca? Here, Rebecca. <laughs> Please get back to us on what you find out. Thank you very much. <laughs> well, you have two other committee members. That's right. Well, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Trish. Because that cost me a Okay. Are we, are we done with the budget for the moment? For the moment. For the, for, for the brief moment. Uh, Alan, should we move back to athletic teams and bleachers update? Because I know that Jeff is patiently waiting. Excuse me. On a uh, little bit more positive note, after that somber few minutes, um, since our last meeting in November, um, we do have a few of our uh, athletic teams that were still competing, and um, I'd just like to uh, congratulate and commend the um, varsity boys and varsity girls cross-country teams that participated in the New England Championships. The boys finished 
um, 14th place out of 30th with uh, Matt Rand finishing a 27th out of 266 runners. And on the girls' side, they finished um, 6th place out of 30 teams, and Emily Atwood finished a 28th out of 259 runners. So um, they truly, as a team, uh, represented Cape Elizabeth in a, in a fine way and um, really um, excited about their success there. Um, also, I would like to congratulate our football team who finished as the uh, semifinal or the regional runner-ups at the uh, Mountain Valley. They played a fantastic game up there and came up just short, I think, with a few extra minutes. We could have uh, maybe turned the corner there, but uh, they had a fantastic season and um, I'd like to congratulate them on their uh, fine season. And a little bit on the bleachers, we did get those finished just in the nick of time for the boys football quarterfinal game at home. And um, they currently right now are um, waiting until spring just to finish up a little bit of the site work um, and a uh, little bit of the paving that's left. But uh, they are very nice and um, heard nothing but positive remarks at, the, at that game and uh, really excited. They look tremendous and... Uh, just a, a really true asset to the community, and um, thank you to everyone that made that happen. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jeff. Okay, <coughs> moving on to uh, 6B, food service, Alan? Yes. Uh, I just have a few words to say about food service, is that uh, as the people who particularly serve on the finance committee know, we have really been struggling with food services this year as far as finances go, uh, making sure, absolutely sure, that we come out at the end of the year with a balanced budget, which is, uh, uh, yeah, which is affected by several things. It's affected by uh, the food service workers and the amount we pay them. It is affected by the changing food products. It is affected by uh, the amount of food that is purchased by students and how often they do that. Uh, so there are many pieces to that puzzle. Uh, I have asked Sue, who is the food service manager, to do a very detailed look at all of these things, uh, to come up with some uh, suggestions and some possibilities as far as what we need to do to ensure that food services is number one, fooding, yeah, providing the food we need for our students, but at the same time, is keeping a very tight rein on all of the expenses. Uh, it is a process we're going through. In that process, I hope that most of you have been to the high school to see the major changes that have taken place there, much of it based on CEF grant money and uh, some other supporting money from other groups. I know the group is also beginning to take a look at Pond Cove in the middle school and some of the changes that will take place there. So on that side of the coin, we are looking at a much more attractive uh, enticing area. Uh, yesterday I did food services uh, at the high school and it was interesting to watch students come in and what they took for food and what they didn't. But I think it's important for all of us to understand food services is a very important part of the big picture of our schools. But food services also is a picture of our schools that must have a balanced budget and therefore we must look at all components of that in that process. So. Uh, the, the look of the facilities, the changes that we've seen in food so far have been excellent, but we need to be sure all of those are balanced out. And it is a job that the food service manager must do in order to be sure that we are uh, in the right ballpark as far as finances are concerned. And I, I was going to say, you might want to speak about that too on the committee. Um, yeah, for the finance committee, um, I, I want to thank all the members um, because we actually had a total of three finance committee meetings since the last um, school board business meeting um, and everybody um, put in a lot of time and effort in, in working with the administration on, on this issue. Um, I do want to just talk, uh, thank all of the Pond Cove parents who took the time to respond to um, Principal Eismeyer's email um, asking for feedback on the lunch program at Pond Cove. And, they were incredibly respectful and thoughtful and constructive. Um, and so I, I really thank them. We had an excellent, excellent response rate. So it's actually 
um, statistically significant um, uh, in terms of what was offered of, of suggestions. And I would just like to say that in addition to um, things like improving the space and things like that, the number one issue that was identified by the parents actually was time allow allotted um, to the lunch program. And I know that, Alan, uh, you were made aware of that and that Tom was. And I'm hoping that the administration will give this some real um, thought and consideration as to how we can provide our students with even five if, and get greedy ten minutes of time um, because I do know um, from my own personal experience that that is a big barrier in terms of parents having their children utilize the lunch program. Having said that, I know that that's uh, easier said than done, but I do think that it will pay off um, fairly substantially um, for the health of the kids um, in terms of eating habits not having to shove food down their mouths in 10 to 15 minutes, um, and also be helpful for our, our lunch services program, which is trying very hard to offer healthy, fresh, um, tasty foods. Anyone else? Can I Karen? Yes. I just wanted to, um, because I do know the issue of time has definitely come up, and, um, and I think that the feedback that you got was very, very helpful. Um, one of the things that we're going to be doing with the group that we've gathered for the middle school pond Co sort of revitalization, if you will, of the cafetorium space is to follow up with some, um, a survey to get feedback on a variety of different things, aesthetics, you know, and how things are going to look, flow, and I think part of the time issue um, could also be related to length of lines and how people are flowing through when kids are being dismissed from class. So we're going to make sure that we take into consideration all elements of why it's taking them so long to eat. And it might be the result of not having enough time. It might be a result of how things are laid out um, and why they don't have enough time within that time frame to eat. So we will definitely be exploring that in, in more depth. Looks like you're going to say something. Yeah. I just want just, just to follow up. Um, I, I do want to say that um, Karen and I talked about this. But, and the one thing that I appreciate that the work that that Lord knows I appreciate it, and it's going to be wonderful what you guys come up with. Um, the concern from the Finance Committee is that we have a, um, a lunch service program this year that is struggling, um, and, I'm, and I think that Karen said that the time frame for some of these changes that they're going to be um, uh, recommending would be next year, and I'm not really sure that we can wait until next year to address the issue of increasing sales of the lunch services, um, lunch, lunches in Pond Cove until next year. So. Well, I'm sure there's going to be some great things developed. I, I again, would just request that, um, Alan, you work with the, the mm -hmm. various people involved to try to come up with Very something that will help us out this year. Yep. Sarah? Um, yeah, one thing I noticed about the lunch time is I remember in middle school and the first few years of high school, it was like the lines were really, really long. And so I would only have literally five to ten minutes to eat after I finally got out of line. But this year they've changed the setup, I'm sure, as you all know, to the double two cash registers where you type in your number and I've noticed a significant increase in time at when I do eat. I mean, I've seen your privilege, but sometimes I only have a half an hour for lunch and when that happens, I do eat in the cafeteria. And um, I noticed a really big difference with that. I have 25 minutes to eat now. Um, it only takes a couple minutes to go through and get my food. So um, I don't know if that changes anything, but I think it's improved a lot by this year. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, Alan, energy? <laughs> energy, yes. <laughs> we need energy. Uh, I just, again, I, I just want to comment on a few of the pieces to the puzzle that we are looking at. The first thing I want to do is to give Ernie McVeigh high credit for all of the work he's done in energy in the last two or three years. Uh, he has, I think, tapped just about every possible way of tapping information to keep energy costs and use, especially usage, down. And unfortunately, sometimes that usage down means that we are still paying more for that. So it, it kind of equals out that way, but at least it isn't increasing the price. But he has been very busy in so many different ways and is continuing to do so. I know people get very frustrated at times when we talk about, okay, let's set the heat at a certain level. And yet you can walk into some rooms and it's a little different than the others. 
Uh, I was in his office yesterday, and he had a workman in there working on that system again to try to get it to equal out. But there are many pieces to the process, but it has gotten much, much better. If you walk around schools, you're going to find that refrigerators in the classroom, uh, microwaves in the classroom, coffee pots in the classroom have disappeared. Uh, that they, the, any equipment that has to be used are in teachers' rooms. Uh, therefore, we don't have the figures yet because this happened only in the last months, a few months. But we are hoping to see a decrease in cost. Number one, because many of these refrigerators, microwaves, and coffee pots were older, and therefore were not as efficient. Uh, number two, uh, that they were were too readily available, and therefore were bringing costs up. And so. We're dealing with that. Doing the same thing with computers to be sure they're turned off at the end of the day, to be sure they're taken care of, be sure that copy machines are taken care of, etc. You, uh, some of you know, I think again it's the Finance Committee, uh, that Ernie was very, very quick in applying for uh, money from a grant from Efficiency Maine to change lighting in the buildings. And he has changed the gyms, which I think many people are thrilled with because now you can see in them which is always a good, a good sign. But we've also found that the cost of the energy by changing the lighting systems is, again, the amount we're using is dropping significantly. Now, don't ask me if it's going to save $421,000, because I don't think it is. But at least every piece that we do is an attempt to make things better. And I think it's important to understand that, that uh, Ernie is dedicated to making that change, and I don't think I see him once when he's not talking to me about one more thing he's going to try. So I think it's important to understand that as a school system, under Ernie's guidance, we are trying to make every possible energy saving move that we possibly can. And I think it's always important to keep that message in front of citizens who might think that we don't do that. But we are, and, we're, and I think Ernie is doing it well, and with the cooperation of the administrators in the buildings, and also the staff, as, he, as these things happen. Great. Thank you. Um, 6D, SEAF grants. Did you say you didn't have any? I have not received the list. Have you, Karen? No, well, yes, and I'm going to ask you a favor. Yes. Because um, <laughs> I forgot my reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I have oh, highlighted okay. everything. Um, I, <laughs> They, CIF was able to give out over $25,000 in grant money, and they, um, there are some wonderful grants that were uh, um, accepted. And if you would be so kind, maybe, Alan, since you're probably more familiar with these than anyone else, just to maybe point sure. out some of the ones that I've highlighted that I wanted to just Certainly. briefly mention. Thank you. Very Thank good. You. Sorry. <laughs> See, you had the information, like, though. That was it out there. And yeah, I we appreciate you having that. That's, yes. that's wonderful. Some of them that I mentioned here, and there are quite a few grants. There were a lot of grant proposals, if I'm not mistaken. They couldn't grant them all, right. but they did a tremendous job in reviewing them. So I look at some of them that Karen has uh, highlighted here. One is therapeutic horseback riding. Um, Morgan Burns, who is the Pond Cove special ed teacher, uh, got this grant for students in the elementary life skills program who will get six therapeutic horseback riding lessons at Riding to the Top <coughs> Center plus transportation, an important piece for them. Uh, Museum of Fine Arts and Maparium, is that what it is, Maparium? Uh, from Deborah Casey at the middle school, a grant to cover a full day field trip for seventh graders to view collection of antiquities and artifacts from the ancient world and other cultures. And Steve, is that the one that's an integrated unit? Yeah, that's the point of it is it's the integration between social studies yes. and arts and trips on the back of uh, the economy. So that's a, that's a particularly interesting, I mean, exciting. Which is where the uh, wide teachers back in the application Yes. Uh, we have the visiting artist, uh, <laughs> Jen Su culture and art of China. I'm sure Marguerite would be happy to collect. Right. All right, very good. <laughs> uh, that was a grant to cover a visiting artist uh, who will teach students in grades five through eight for six days about Chinese brush painting, et cetera. Uh, we had the virtual high school, which was funded this year. Uh, and therefore, that grant is covering uh, students at both uh, Cape Elizabeth High School and South Portland High School in a program or programs that are not offered uh, regularly through the school system. And I believe Brandy LaPointe is our person who's program manager to oversee that. Um, we did have a computer communication and CAD technology upgrade. 
uh, and that was with Evan Thayer uh, as a grant covering software and four PC computers, two webcams, and payment in kind gift cards for college students to create a state-of-the-art technology, robotics, and engineering lab. And I would add to that, if you have not been to Evan's classroom while he's working with these young people with this, please do. It is the most exciting place you will ever see, and he does such an amazing job with them. Uh, Gretchen McNulty got a World Affairs Council grant uh, to cover consultants, speakers, and materials for World Affairs Council. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jeff Shedd, <laughs> yeah. I may have to have him explain this, got one on dance instruction for, <laughs> at Phys Ed and at people with middle school. Uh, it's a, a grant to add an instruction on the basic dance skills <laughs> for high school physical education programs and if it is successful, uh, Jeff will seek a professional services increase in the school budget to cover the program for the future. <laughs> <laughs> and, and there was unanimous support amongst the parents on the seat board for this. <laughs> and I have to say, when Jeff let me know it, I was in hysterics in my office reading it on email as well. But I'm pleased it got financed. <laughs> uh, we have Dr. Efron has one called Clickers, which is a grant to cover 23 remote kits which include 32 students and one teacher remote clickers, uh, base receiver unit, uh, fin uh, flash drive and software, and a case. The goal is to increase learning with a one-to-one -one class environment. Uh, we also had a social networking uh, site education from Je Jeff again. Boy, Jeff, you were busy. A grant pays for 50% of fees for consultant Jane Hitchcock to uh, speak to students, staff, and parents about social networking sites. That also involves the middle school as well. It also, okay. Okay, so the middle school and the high school. We have HOPE, a website design and printed materials. Uh, that again is high school and middle school uh, to develop a website for the HOPE program, which is healthy outreach for prevention and education. Uh, those are just some of them that were granted, and as I, again, I know there were a lot of them that because I think there were seventy-nine thousand dollars worth of requests. Seventy-nine thousand dollars worth of requests, and over twenty-five thousand were granted. There isn't one that wasn't listed on there. All of them are listed, with the exception of the Pond Cove new teacher induction. Um, yes. They're going to continue that this year. And I just wanted to comment. I mean, how fortunate we are, especially in this economic climate, to have an organization like CEF because this is some good news and all the bad news we're constantly getting. It's so exciting that we can have people go make these grants, I mean, develop these grants, and, and then this is what's so exciting about education when these types of things happen. And one of my questions, well, maybe it's a, a moot point, I was going to say what happens when <coughs> they don't get accepted, but um, perhaps we've already answered that question. Trisha? Uh, I have the same question, but I, I don't know, I mean, it's, on a positive note, um, I think it needs, some of those grants would be helpful if we knew what they were because even more our goals and the district goals are going to come into play when we do the budget and some of them may fit into them more so than sure. other programs we already have. So I don't know how to complete the loop. If, I will if, certainly send all of this on to you so you can review okay. them and so that you at least are familiar with all the ones. So you have that on email and so you could just forward it I to all of us? Price. Yes. Okay, good. So Trish, I'm not sure I'm understanding. Where in well, the loop for, do you want us to be? Well, I guess that's a question that maybe needs to be discussed. Like, for example, I know the data grant, the data request did not get funded. And I know that was an important program from a technology standpoint, from a data standpoint, from a, a uh, inf informing instruction standpoint. So I, ha I would hate to see Steve's rejection say that it's never going to happen. Obviously, we're not floating in the dough right now, but I think it needs to be part of our conversation at a budget level. So I, I guess I don't, I don't know. I'm opening it up for conversation that once it goes to Steve, it's also important information for us to know what some of the educators are well, thinking about and how that gets so that just doesn't get dropped when it doesn't get funded. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think actually the process started with us. I think it was part of the budget documents that we were working from, and then, and then we had to make some cuts to the budgets in front of us. This was one of the 
impacts that was felt by that, at which point then I, this, um, whoever shepherded that grant request thought, well, perhaps there's some way they could get financial assistance from C. So I would imagine then, if next year were to be so wonderfully healthy, financially healthy, it would appear in the budget request again, because it's something that's critical to our um, <clears throat> educational programming here in terms of helping to guide um, our curriculum discussions and our personnel discussions, so all of that. Um, whether it remains in the budget again, right? I mean, we've been, we, this happened with the nursing position for a number of years, so I could see that it could happen with this data um, project. So if I, could add, if I could add one piece to that. Uh, as you know, we did hire Zine, Dean Zaharis this year. Mm -hmm. uh, I have met with Dean and Gary yesterday, as a matter of fact. Uh, what we are going to do is I'm going to be pulling together administrators from each building to meet with Dean. He is going to start to try to build a data processing program, an in-house program based on PowerSchool, so that we are, it's one of those things I'm not willing to let die, like curriculum instruction and assessment. So we're going to do what we can to manage that and make it happen. Knowing that Scarborough did purchase uh, a program, uh, we're going to use them as a model as far as what does that program show us and how can we help develop it. But I have also had conversations with some people from CEIF and said again, we will come back again, but I can't let it die just because it didn't get funded. We need, we'll, we'll do everything we can to move ourselves along. So the administrators uh, are going to meet with me. I just, uh, I've got to, I was going to have a meeting with them on Thursday. I can't do it because one of, uh, some of them aren't going to be here. So we're going to meet next week. And we're going to talk about what do we want for data and how do we help Dean begin to set up that plan. And, I, and that, that was just one hypo yep. example, yep. but I'm assuming that all of the other um, grants that were, you know, either whether they made it to see because they weren't in our original budget or vice versa, that you and the other administrators are aware of what they are so that when the budget happens again, there's an, there's an, an awareness of what's important, are there trade-offs that can be made, are those really important? I just would hate to see it, a, a grant rejected and then n never surface again. And I would say to you very honestly, uh, there are some schools who've done a very good job of sending the grant on to me so I can look at it before they go out. There are some schools who don't. So, on that grant list that I just read, there were several of them I knew because the grant had come to me beforehand, but there were grants on there I had never heard of. And so, so that is still a process, and it's still, it is very clear uh, that there are some schools who, who work very diligently to make sure I also know what's going on. But it, your question is absolutely appropriate and one I need to work on. <coughs> okay. Um, Alan, Pond Cove Teacher Family Medical Leave. Press letter? Yes. And this is only an informational letter and it is not one that you need to vote on. But basically, it is a letter from Holly Forsyth, who's a grade three teacher at Pond Cove. And she, in her letter, says, I am writing to inform you of my pregnancy. I am due the last week of April and would like to take the remainder of the year at home. I do plan to return to teaching uh, next November. We did the calculations, and if she goes to term, she will be out the amount of time that is approved by the board anyway, and so she will not have to ask for more time. It could change if I have to have many snow days. So we'll all hope for no snow days, including seniors, correct? And so, so at this point in time, this is only an informational letter, but because I'd like to have you know what's going on. Okay, uh, new business, consideration of Ted Jordan slash Jeff Shedd's proposed AP government class trip to Washington, D.C. in April 2009. Jeff is standing in for Ted today. I think you've all heard um, Ted speak to these trips in the past. They're very educationally beneficial. Um, the students meet with a variety of officials in Washington um, in a number of different departments, and it will certainly be very exciting to do that this year because students will be able to get a sense of, that's not a political comment, just in terms of the change in administration that's happening, it will, be a, it will be a different experience and it will open up some new opportunities because very largely what Ted does is he draws on the connections that he's developed over the years. Um, 
and so this will open up some, some new connections. Um, the trip is uh, uh, scheduled to begin March 29th. Uh, there are three school days that students will be missing. Um, I think we've got the documents. Uh, he's got the appropriate number of chaperones and the appropriate mix of genders of chaperones and a parent um, pre-conference or pre-trip meeting that's been scheduled. Um, I do need to say, um, well, I'll, I'll just add on a positive, that if Ted would be delighted um, to come to his students, as he's done from time to time in the past after the trip happens, um, to talk about what the students got out of it, if that's something that the board has time to do. Um, but I will also say that there is, there is a possibility that this, may, this trip may, be, may become moot and may not be able to happen because of budget issues. Uh, because, um, and that is uncertain right now because there are um, traditionally um, the school budget pays for a couple of the staff chaperones um, and Ted gets um, some grant money to pay for other chaperones and then we're able to, so whether or not we're able to spend that, mo that, that money that traditionally comes out of the school budget, I'm not certain. And if we can't get the number of chaperones that we need, then the trip may not happen. Um, that's a conversation I've just begun to have, begun to, uh, to have with Ted. And, you know, there are other possibilities in terms of fundraising and that sort of thing as well that could potentially make a trip happen that may not otherwise because Jeff, of this. You know, why does it have to be staff chaperones? If par couldn't parents be chaperones? It could be. I mean, if, and if there were parents who were willing to pay the price, um, they could, but the price would be the same whether it's staff or, or, in fact, one of the chaperones that's scheduled to go is not a staff chaperone. And in the past we have used parents, but customarily what we've tried to do is make it so that the chaperones are not having to pay their own way um, for an educational trip to benefit our students. So how is this funded then? Um, I have been using, uh, well, once, one, traditionally the High School Parent Association has funded one chaperone position. Uh, the school budget is used professional development money because I think there are, there are legitimate professional development parts of what happens um, for the staff to be a part of this. And that's the part of it that's in question. Um, because half the chaperone expenses in the past have been borne by the school budget. And the students pay their own way. The students pay their own way. Okay. I mean, the other possibility would be to simply increase the amount that the students are requested to pay, and, and but whether that's the best scenario, I mean, that's not the best scenario in this economic environment as well. I just wanted to mention it as a possibility, so so we I, it's still important to get the trip approved. Um, and um, Ted told me to mention for any of you who've heard about last year's sort of mishap about what day they were returning and what time they were returning that he's going to have Ms. McNulty check all his dates and all of his time, so everything will be the same date, the same time, and the students won't have to be divided up. But uh, he's very much looking forward to go. I know that if the AP class can't go, that including Sarah and Andrew, I believe that they will be sorely disappointed because this has been become sort of a tradition uh, of the AP government class over the years. Yeah. I thought I heard Sarah and Andrew say they were going to do a fundraiser. I know. <laughs> There we go. Are we thinking about that, right? Please. <laughs> I don't know if there are any questions. I'd be glad to answer any questions. Any questions for Jeff? Okay. Thank you. Any questions? No. Um, do, what, is there a motion? I move that we approve the um, AP government trip to Washington, D.C. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Um, discussion? All in favor? Six zero. Okay. Uh, consideration of policies for second reading. Trish. Um, yeah, they, I will do these one at a time since we need to vote on them. Um, I just will comment that none of these received any comments or concerns or questions from the board at first reading or subsequent. Um, the first policy is JJB school sponsorship of social activities. I would like to move that we approve it as presented. Second. Discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Um, the second policy is JRA, student records and retention. Um, I'd like to move that we um, approve this policy as presented. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Um, the next document is JRA-R. It's a guideline. We don't technically need to vote on it. That will support or accompanies the policy we just voted on. Um, the third one is JLCC, communicable diseases. Um, and I'd like to move that we approve this as presented. Thank you, Trish. 
Second. Thank you, Linda. Discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Okay. Uh, Trish, going on to policies for first reading. Yes. Um, the first one, FF-R, is naming of school facilities. These are guidelines. This is not a policy. We won't need to vote on it. This is an FYI. Um, the guidelines that were added were developed by um, Alan along with the Ernie, I think? Yes. Um, and this is to address the concern and the questions that were raised earlier in the spring. When we have a request for signage, it is hoped that these guidelines will um, assist with compliance with town ordinances and consistency in signage in the community. If there are, even though we're not voting on it, if people have questions or concerns, we can certainly amend them. I, I should just uh, put in briefly, it wasn't Ernie, that's Bob Malley. Oh, I'm thank you, Alan, sorry. Um, the next one, JIB, student involvement in decision making. We're not, the policy committee is not recommending any changes to that. Um, JLCB, the school immunization policy, this was reviewed by the nursing staff um, and it reflects current law, so that is presented, we're presenting it as such. Um, the last policy is new board member orientation. Um, I think the only thing that needs to, this is the MSMA version, an updated version of a policy that we already have. Um, it seems to incorporate and encompass what was in our original, but also is updated for the um, new freedom of access training. When we present it for second reading, um, I've made a note already. I would suggest that we take out the various notes in here that don't mm. need to stay in here. That won't be in the final presentation. That was, I was going to ask that. Um, and um, so there you are. Again, if anyone has any questions or concerns or suggestions, um, please let me know and we'll discuss them at the policy committee before bringing these for second reading. Anybody have anything for Trish on any of those? No? Okay. Um, D, consideration of superintendent's recommendation, re recommendation for middle school athletic fee position. Okay. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I should say to you that there are two positions in here. One's an athletic position and one is a co-curricular position. I have kept them in because I look at them as part of the, sal uh, the salary negotiations agreements. And so I've kept them in. If, uh, there is a desire to look at them differently, why that would be a discussion with the board. But for the extracurricular position, and I may need some help from you, Jeff, because I don't know if I know all the answers to this. This is from Scott Labby. This is for Jane Thomas, who will be the middle school Nordic coach, uh, coaching level one. Uh, it says that this is not a new position, but if she is a new hire. And I think the question that went with it, and uh, I didn't, wasn't able to find the answer before I left the office today, it said that Jane had been a volunteer for two years with our Nordic program. She is familiar with the program. She has attended NENSA coaching clinics. She will be an excellent addition to our coaching staff. I think the question that was asked of me is, is this a position that was in place? A coach left, and she is replacing that coach? Correct. Yep, there are two positions for the middle school Nordic. Okay. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I move that we accept the superintendent's recommendation for the extracurricular position for um, the Nordic ski team at Cape Elizabeth. Thank you, Karen. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Linda. Discussion? All in favor? Wait, did you have, no. did you have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. Was there a question? I didn't see your hand. I'm. Oh, you're mulling? I'm mulling because we're, after our conversation this evening, I'm not quite sure why we're doing this, but I know that we're going to have a separate meeting to have this conversation, so go ahead and ask what you want. <laughs> I'm ready. You're ready now? I'm ready now. <laughs> All in favor? 6 0. Okay. I'll look at it the next time. That's okay. Consideration of the superintendent's recommendation for high school extracurricular fee position. Okay, and this one is for Joyce Bell as a research coordinator at the high school. This is not a new position, and she is not a new hire. And Jeff, I 
probably would ask you to, if you would come up for just a minute, to talk about what a research coordinator is. I know it's a position that's been there. Right now. I honestly don't know what the genesis of the label is. It is essentially, it makes Joyce part of the department chair, sort of core at the high school, as she has been for a long time. She does do, and, and I'm sure the genesis of the label relates to the fact that she spends a lot of time above and beyond the school day coordinating with other departments, coordinating with teachers about what their research needs are, coordinating calendars, and working on the research guidelines booklet that she updates every single year. Um, it's a lot of work sort of above and beyond the school day. Um, that's probably, but it's a title that's been in place for beyond me. Um, so it's really, it's, it's the department chair of the high school and the library uh, reflects the fact that she does a lot of work above and beyond the school day related specifically to research, but also attending department chair meetings on a regular basis as she does and being an important part of that team. Thank you, Jeff. Yep. Okay. Um, is there a motion? I move we accept the superintendent's recommendation for research coordinator at the high school. Thank you, Linda. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Trish. Discussion? Uh, yeah, I guess going back to that same issue, um, you have a budget freeze. Mm -hmm. Is this considered, which excludes this point salary? It's stipended. Is it a gray area, or are you throwing it into? Uh, no, what I have done at this point in time, to be very honest with you, is, is, that, is this co curricula uh, position is within the contract. And so I did continue on from there uh, because we haven't really had any conversations about dropping co curricular positions that are, are agreed in the contract. I'm certainly willing to have that conversation. But if we have the conversation, we should be having it in terms of all of them, right. not right. just individuals. Right. Yeah, no, I just, right. that's exactly but right. I'm just wondering going right. forward. Right. No, I agree. Thank you. Rebecca? <laughs> I want to make sure I give you your opportunity. No, no, don't. <laughs> Any more questions? All in favor? 6-0. OK. Uh, community services appointments. Um, Alan, do you have? Yes. Oh, yeah. Um, I might add more one. for the high Is school. Is the Gretchen McNulty oh. one, in, one yeah. on this one? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh. Oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Oh, I don't have it. Here. Thank you. Yeah. She's got one now. Okay, I also have a second one. Well, is that uh, this? That? Oh, this is from Mary Bruns. This is the extracurricular positions uh, that are mentors for, for new teachers. And they have all come before you, except for this one for Roz Gross. Is that right, Gross? Who is a half time art teacher at the high school. And so Gretchen McNulty will be her uh, mentor. Uh, this is position for $650. It is funded in the budget and is not a new position and is not a new hire. These are positions, just as a reminder for you, that uh, several years ago, long before I was a superintendent, the state changed the certification requirements and made it necessary for us to have mentors within the school system for new teachers. And so Mary and uh, Shari, did the training with the state a few years ago and established these positions uh, based on that state uh, regulation. And so that's what this is. You have approved all the others, uh, but this one is a, a new one, not a new one, but because of when the teacher is here. She's not here full time all year. So another state unfunded mandate? Oh, yes. Kind of thing. Oh, yes. Just checking. Yeah. Okay. Um, then I guess we need to have a motion on um, Gretchen. I move that we approve the superintendent slash Mary Brown's recommendation for um, Gretchen McNulty to serve as the mentor for the Ross Gross. Thank you, Trish. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Rebecca. Discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Thank you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, now we move on to community services appointment, and um, we can pass yep. those out. And maybe you could, Alan, give your 
dissertation about what a you know about it, and if you don't know about it, we'll make Janet come up and say something. <laughs> so you better hope I do a good job, Janet. That's all I can say. Thank you. <laughs> He'll be all right. Did you give me? I think we're missing. No, we're not. Here, this is the one. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is give you the best explanation I can for this. Uh, apparently, every year there are appointments to community services advisory commissions. Uh, most of those are commission people who are approved by, selected by the town council. There is just one area where it is a, there are representatives from both the town council and from the school board. Uh, the first time I heard of this, I think, was two years ago, and it may have been three, when we had an opening and a person had to be selected for that opening. And so what happened was it went through the uh, interviews by the appointments committee, and then information was fed back to me. This year, apparently, we have two openings, as, as I have for explanation. One is for Peter Daly, who has resigned, and the other one is a full three-year position. So in that process, two people have applied for that. The first one that you have is Fred Sturdivant, who many of you may recognize the name. He was a candidate for the school board. He was interviewed, and you see the results of this information uh, through Deborah Lane uh, back to me to provide to you. I just got this this week, so uh, that's why I'm a little uh, backed up on all of this. The second one you have is for uh, Carolyn Flaherty. Oh, yes, Carolyn Flaherty. I knew it was somebody I knew, and I couldn't remember who it was who has also expressed uh, interest. She has sent a letter and also her resume at this point in time. Now, here is, here is the problem that I have with this or the question that I have with this. Because this is so infrequent, I have never set up a committee. I've always, it's always gone through the town. Uh, but my question was, and I talked to Kathy today about it because I just received the information. Should I bring this for you to look at tonight? and make a decision on it, or to look at it and make a decision next month. Uh, I would say to you that from my perspective anyway, and I think I'm speaking for Janet, is these are two very solid candidates who would work very well with Janet and the uh, Community Service Advisory Commission. Am I correct on that, Janet? I'm not lying. At any. Okay, so, so that's where I'm at on this issue. This is one that has is not is so infrequent that it's one I have did not have a lot of information on, but I do have a letter from Deb Lane, who is the assistant town manager and the town clerk, uh, explaining what they did, the interviews they did, and the information they received. And supposedly these people are supposed to be voted on by the town council on December eighth. And there's two positions, and there's two people. Two positions, two people. Okay. Yep. <laughs> is this is Janet? seen their information and, and is comfortable with the, I mean, I would look to her for her recommendation, and based on that, that's how I would vote. Janet, you want to come up? Sorry, Janet, you got to speak. <laughs> I saw you try to slither down the chair, into the chair. <laughs> Sorry, Janet. Um, the scenario is that community services has a commission of seven. Um, we're down to three. Um, so we are anxious to get more representation on our commission at this time. Um, two from are to be appointed by the school board and two from the town council at this time. Um, I don't know the status of the town council. I'm assuming that they had plenty and these were the overflow. I don't know exactly. I have not seen the applications. I have only heard the names. I know both of them from their children being part of our program and them frequenting our facility, um, and I have no qualms with either of them being part. We just want a good representation to our commission um, for, from the community, and as long as we have that so that we can get, have eyes and ears in the community from all different directions, that's what we're looking for, um, and I think we can work well with all, anyone. So I think that those two people certainly are quality candidates, and I have no problem with either one of them. So. And I don't have any problem with that tonight, but I would definitely ask that perhaps next time that Janet get the names and the information ahead of time so she can feel more, I mean, just have, be a little bit more better informed about people. 
Yeah, I guess the only other thing is just to make sure that the school board is comfortable with the, the, um, the people representing the school side of things to community services. I think that's the reason for the division between town and school in the community services um, arena. Because we're supposed to represent so they're, so, both. So they're representing the school board? We have X number of school appointed people and X number of town appointed people. And my assumption is, is that is so that we have a good representation of both the school component of what we are involved in and a town component of what we are involved in. That's why you recommend certain number. So out of, so there were actually four candidates and the we have, we have four openings. Okay. Were there not that we're chasing them away, and not that I've chased them away or anything like that. <laughs> um, but we've had people that have overcommitted themselves, and it's time for them to make decisions. So we have four openings. Do we have a total of four candidates? No. Two from the two town, candidates. two from the schools. Oh. I don't know about the town. All I know is the two that have been brought forth here. I think that the town spilled them because they're only advertising for Arts Commission or members at this point in time so I think they filled all of their slots um, I, I would just say that we should yeah, probably yeah. do whatever we can to help out the Commission and get it right. filled exactly but moving forward you know it would be helpful to know if Deborah said or whoever yeah that um, we're looking for two school people and, and two town people and people right. applied for those right um, and that you Alan or you I guess it would be Alan that would see them then uh, because it's representing the school sides you should you should have seen them ahead of time yeah and I uh, was somewhat blind on this to yeah be very honest. so just moving yeah. going forward I think we just need to be clearer with Deborah about what the process should be that we're not getting it the night before or the week before okay is there is there a motion then to accept these two individuals? So moved. Thank you, Trish. Second. Thank you, Linda. Discussion? All in favor? 6-0. Okay. Um, committee reports. Are there any committee reports that anyone feels are important to bring up to the board tonight? Can I just comment very quickly on the status of sports done right? Yep. Um, and that is that Janet Hoskins and Jeff Thorick and Steve, Jim Stevenson from the Sports Done Right group and Ken Pierce and I will be meeting next week to come up with our agenda and action plan to get the Sports Done Right leadership team up and running again in January. I think it's fair to say that Janet and Jeff have had a lot on their plate as they've transitioned into their new positions. And, um, but they're both very supportive of wanting to follow through with the accreditation and we're looking forward to getting that um, up and running again. So just wanted to let the school board know where we were with that. Thank you. Anybody else? No? No other committee? All right. Um, public comment on agenda items? Seeing none. Uh, school board agenda requests? Uh, announcement of upcoming meetings, um, they're on the web. Does anybody want me to go through these? Yes. Um, personnel has been uh, canceled for this month. Okay. We will reschedule for January. All right, thank you, Linda. So personnel will not be on Thursday, December 11th. Right. Other changes? Omissions? Okay. Then I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Thank you, Linda. Second. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Discussion? <laughs> All in favor? 6-0. Thank you very much.